Thank you, Francisco, again for the invitation and for all your colleagues to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Canada. <clears throat> um, that image is uh, of a boy uh, using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I'm not sure if you've, um, it resonates with some of my interest in um, uh, emo how emotions are mobilized in, in uh, autism activism, and obviously hope is, uh, is an important emotion. Uh, in this case, um, there's not much evidence how that it's effective um, for uh, for kids, for autistic kids, but it's extremely popular um, and has been in Canada for a little while. So, what do you need to know about Canada? Um, I'm gonna just uh, give a little overview. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the political system, a little bit about this contested terrain of autism uh, and autistic activism. I want to talk about what it means to feel autism politics. Uh, and just please stop me if there's something that's not entirely clear. Uh, and a little bit about neurodiversity. Partly because Canadians are obsessed with diversity. But they don't think about diversity in this type of way of thinking about diversity. Um, so let me say a little bit about the, the, the uh, political context. Do you know what this is? Our Prime Minister. This is our Prime Minister. <laughs> Isn't he sexy? So, so you need to see, he's sitting on a desk. That's his wife, Sophie Gregoire. They're a very hot couple. Uh, and this was in the magazine Vanity Fair. You know Vanity Fair in New York. And people are saying, what the heck? I mean, he has to run the country. Anyway, so it's a very hot picture. Um, but I use it just by way of saying that um, Canada has come back from a very long period of conservative rule and the election of this uh, government under Justin Trudeau, the son of one of the previous Prime Ministers, Pierre Elie Trudeau, was welcomed with giddy optimism by a lot of people. Um, liberals espouse progressive social values, political values, support, and uh, in principle, support for an extensive, robust welfare state. And that's why I want to pick that up. We have a federal system of government that's, you know, in large measure screwed up because um, people cling to a narrative of, uh, of federal intervention, but the real work of politics happens at the level of provinces. We have 10 provinces, we have three territories in Canada. So in the field of autism, provinces matter significantly, people focus on the federal government as being the savior. So it's, it's screwed up. But we have him. So. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, so what does it mean to talk about autism and autistic activism in Canada? I've been trying to think about it using some of this work from uh, the sociology of emotions as well. Um, I've done some thinking about it in the context comparing this again Canada against the US and trying to argue that um, hope is the kind of dominant emotion that is articulated in Canadian policy around and politics around autism and um, and thinking about how fear is ex extremely prevalent in US based type of discourses but I just want to talk a little bit because part of what I'm trying to think about um, when we think about this larger project am I going too fast uh, but the larger project is this notion of how uh, feeling rules move across contexts. So a feeling rule, according to Arlie Hochschild, who did this really fantastic work, and you may have heard of the book called The Managed Heart, uh, in which she looked at the flight attendants and talked about the emotional labor they have to perform, smiling at us, and this kind of thing. But she used this notion of feeling rules, which I think captures how we, uh, what becomes appropriate to express emotionally changes, it shifts. Uh, and so that's the sort of starting point for my own, for my own thinking about how uh, particular feelings are appropriate or not appropriate, and we also understand whether it's appropriate to feel an emotion. So sometimes we might think it's not correct to be angry, or, and we, so we, we adjust our, our behavior accordingly. Um, Whereas many people have said about politics that if you think about HIV and AIDS activism, being angry was a very important and uh, 
emotion to express in politics, right? So it's not about saying there's good emotion, bad emotion. That's, that's not the point. Uh, the point is to think about how what we understand as appropriate or inappropriate, how those boundaries shift. So feeling roles, feeling roles helps me think about this uh, in this context and also to challenge the idea that what we want is more hope because I don't think necessarily that hopeless is, is, um, is always uh, a, a very positive emotion in the field of autism. Thank you. So um, I put this up but I'm also not very happy with this distinction I've used in my own work. Um, I think it's clear to talk about parent-led activism and advocacy um, and the idea of support for early intervention programs. There's a controversy now in Canada, I'll talk about that later, about um, um, limiting access based on age uh, and how that has a lot of people pissed off. Um, and then autistic activism, obviously, to talk about self-advocacy by people who are autistic. Um, and we know a bit of that, the diverse, neurodiversity stuff. Why I say I'm not happy with this is because there are folks who, parents, who are not, who would fit more in the autistic category because they have accepted their own children, their own experience, and so are not necessarily trying to uh, cure their children's autism, but they're really trying to become advocates and help their children become advocates. So it, it disturbs this idea that parents are here and self-advocates are here. It's not, it doesn't, it's, I think that's changing, and it has been changing for a little while, but it's easy for us to always assume that the parent and that advocacy is problematic and that self-advocacy is always the best and most authentic form of, of engagement. Thank you. So what do people argue about everything, of course? Um, so um, some of uh, what I've done in, in looking at even doing some interviews, this idea that people are too autistic or not autistic enough has come up uh, a fair bit. Um, in Canada, I would say we don't have as much of the debate about um, uh, vaccines as they've had in the U.S. context, because that really has framed the kind of the kind, a lot of the politics. Um, but because we're Canadian, we don't really argue too much. We're, we're generally nicer and more more respectful. And um, but in the first in the first case, um, there was a, a very very public debate about whether early intervention, uh, intensive behavioral intervention treatment should be covered as part of what Canadians understand as universal health insurance, universal health coverage. We don't uh, have complete coverage for everything in Canada, but we, we do okay. We do better than the U.S. for sure. We're always happy to say that. But this case, um, the Canadian Supreme Court, the highest court in Canada said that um, the province of British, British Columbia was not obligated to cover the cost of treatment for children. Um, and uh, so that's been a challenge for, you know, provinces can do it, but they're not required to, and the idea of treatment is not something that, uh, under the Canadian system, would be called medically necessary. So if it's medically necessary, we cover it, we, you don't pay for it out of your pocket. Okay, so Canada has universal health insurance, but it doesn't mean that there's no private system. We're talking about private. There's elements of, as well about private and public. So, um, when I want to talk about the role of, do you know that, uh, have you seen this before? The prototype of the squeeze machine from uh, Temple Grandin. Um, so when we want to talk, what does it mean to, to feel autism politics? Part of my interest, and it's not just about being Canadian, or, or, but in, and also part of this larger pro product, uh, project is, uh, what does it mean to think about affect or emotions in politics and what is the kind of really contradictory, paradoxical role to talk about emotions in, in the context of autism because autism is always seen as a disorder of affect, a disorder uh, or lack. Uh, autistic people are seen as lacking emotion. Parents and loved ones are always overly emotional, hysterical, irrational, right? Um, and media representations really prey on fear, anxiety, dread, uh, but also hope passion, love, I mean, um, to, uh, Chloe Silverman's book on, on really talking about love in a significant way is important. Um, but for, for um, I guess, 
as someone who studies politics, uh, there has been a lot of effort made to try to um, underplay, downplay the role of emotion in politics. So that's part of what I'm trying to recover and think about is um, if we stop being obsessed with what is rational uh, and or think about rationality as, inter as uh, not interfering as emotions is not interfering with rationality with reason maybe we could help it could help us to think more fruitfully about the role of emotion and affect um, in in this particular in this particular field but every time I talk about emotion in policy making people just say well we, we make decisions and of course in autism we make decisions based on evidence evidence based inter intervention evidence 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 um, but I think we could say that evidence interacts with other forms of, of knowing and of, 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 of being. Um, and the other problem for me, as someone interested in social movements, is um, when I hung out with some autistic people years ago, I, I automatically assumed that the people um, who were there for this big meeting in the U.S. wanted to be together, wanted to hang out. And um, one of the first things that a, a person told me, I said, oh, it must be cool to be here with all these autistic people, you know. And he said, are you crazy? I would rather be anywhere than be here. But I'm here because I want information. I'm here because I want. Uh, so I think there's an assumption, from my perspective, as someone who studies social movements, the social we take for granted. And the starting point for thinking about how to think politically about autism is what happens when the real challenge is getting people to engage collectively because they don't really want to. Um, and I don't have an answer. I, I, I'm, I'm really trying to think about it, but certainly everything I've read on social movements always assumes that people kind of want to hang out and get together and build an identity and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and if you look at the LGBT movement, if you look at the whole the women's movement, this is really what becomes the grounds for making claims. Uh, but when people say, uh, I'm not really interested in that kind of collective engagement, does it mean they're not being political? I think they, mean they are being political. It's, it's just kind of shifting how we think what, what is and what isn't political. So I don't have an answer for that. I just throw it out there. Am I doing OK for time? Yes. OK, so. Yes, well, you know, Jenny McCarthy. I don't want to say much except that um, we haven't spoken about gender very much, and, and part of what, um, as uh, when we think about the Canadian context as well, there's a sense in which we've moved to talking about care a lot. I don't know how much how that resonates in Brazil or in other contexts, but we all talk about an ethic of care. Well, the ethic of care is highly, highly gendered, right? And so, when we talk about uh, about emotions in in the, in the autistic uh, dimension. We have to think about that as highly, highly gendered. Uh, I don't know where the men are. They're, they're, they're not really present, right? Uh, and then what ends up happening is we have people like Jenny McCarthy who stand in for the mother warriors who are fighting autism, right? Um, and also I was trying to think about this as a activism as a kind of form of biographical disruption, which comes out of some of the literature and sociology, but the idea that when people become engaged politically, and there are some, some examples of this in the Canadian context. Uh, it really changes, it disrupts, it, it, it transforms how they understand themselves, their identity, who they are, who, how they interact with other people. And in the literature, they took a fancy term, biographical disruption, to sort of think about that. Okay, so I talked about that earlier, but... Um, so the idea of thinking about autism politics in Canada as an affective terrain is really to kind of push back at this idea of what's rational or not, uh, and to think about how the environment, the landscape of activism, um, is shaped by emotion. Uh, and the political economy of hope was uh, sort of the term that's used by Nicholas Rose and Carlos Novas in an older piece, not about autism though. Um, but um, I won't spend too much time on that, just a little, little bit. But uh, the idea that we have to. Um, that we can talk about um, uh, in, in the Canadian context here, uh, the idea that uh, life itself is locked into an economy for the generation of wealth, vitality, 
Um, and we can talk about this in the context of an attachment to our welfare state, an attachment to investing in children, which, you know, is very, very significant in the Canadian context, because at one point when people said, we can't afford this welfare state, then people said, but what about children? And they said, well, we love children. We have to love children. We don't care about the adults, but we love the children. And so uh, the, the, they talked instead about the idea of social investment. So, so the state invested in children because children are an important investment and they have a return. We can have a return on our investment if these children don't go to jail and, uh, and become drained on society. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but so, but this idea sort of, of uh, an advocacy that's anchored in a discourse of hope really depends upon a very active form of citizenship um, and a particular attachment to what the welfare state means to people. And that's not just, I think that has effect, affective dimensions as well. People get very excited in Canada. We don't get excited very often, but we do get excited when there's a challenge and a threat to the welfare state. And this is why the Supreme Court case was so important, because it was about the welfare state. It was about saying, what does the welfare state, what do we collectively owe to people? Versus, um, you know, and, and, and that really becomes the grounds for some political claims making. Oh, that's just horse therapy. So I won't spend too much time on that. If you haven't seen that work, uh, it's, it's interesting in the context too, Charlotte, what you were talking about, I think um, we also become enmeshed in this more where there are these projects or um, collaborations that involve scientists, researcher, um, you know, um, lived experience, people with lived experience. And this, in some way, is what, what they were talking about, I think, when they came up with this idea of a political economy of hope, is that um, there's a challenge to existing expertise and authority on the one hand, because you bring different types of actors to the table, but there's also kind of a reinscription of that authority and expertise, because it's not just everybody agrees about the terms and the conditions. Uh, there are certain types of knowledge that you know rise up. So it's um, it's this. People talk about a democratization of science, but I, I'm not certain that that always is at play when we talk about some of these projects where they're being led by. Uh, particular scientists who say, "Oh, we need someone with lived experience. Can you just, you know, please have a seat?" And, and but um, and it comes off. It, it, it's presented as a form of collaboration. Uh, but we, ha I think, we have to sort of be careful in how um, the, there is an economy around the production of particular autist of a, a knowledge that depends on autistic people to be actively shaping that, uh, but not too much. You know. Uh, so I, I, I think that this notion of, of political economy of hope is helpful in thinking through that. So uh, just a lot, I think I'll just finish on talking a little bit about the um, the autism as a form of neurodiversity, just because I think in Canada um, we've done some of the most I think advanced thinking about diversity. Uh, Charles Taylor and various philosophers have really kind of been some of the pivotal figures in uh, uh, you know around the world. Jim Telly. Uh, thinking about um, indigenous people, thinking about ethnic diversity, racial diversity, linguistic diversity is always a problem in Canada. Um, but it, but we seem to have difficulty accommodating different forms of, uh, some forms of diversity, specifically around uh, disability and how that is presented as a form of, um, as, as a, a diversity. And I just sort of talk about two distinct challenges to how we think about our well, how welfare states can accommodate diversity, and uh, then I'll wrap it up just a couple of seconds. Thank you. Uh, so I mentioned that, the sort of privileging of certain forms of diversity, always kind of the ideas of trade-offs between diversity and the welfare state. Um, and uh, when disability is concerned, it remains trapped by a focus on accommodating physical disability, because um, that often happens within the frame of disability, that when people talk about accommodation, they're like, well, there's a ramp over here, so you should be fine. Um, and when you think about cognitive disability, it's not, it's not a, always a, a, an easy fit. Um, so the challenges are kind of, again, around accommodating neurodiversity and expanding the conception of Medicare, which keeps plugging away. That's sort of why I started with liberal uh, Trudeau, because there's a lot of uh, excitement that maybe, just maybe, with the new 
government, there'll be a more um, a revisiting of the concept, the idea of expanding Medicare to include coverage for, um, for treatment. Uh, on the other hand, um, what's happening at the level of provinces in Canada and Ontario, one of the largest provinces, um, there's a cap for treatment so that um, the Ontario government decided that, well, they don't have a lot of money and we need to limit and increase the likelihood, um, the success, uh, and so we're going to limit treatment for kids aged two to five. Um, and so parents are, what about my child? What about my child? And um, but it's it's what they're arguing is that it's evidence based that we know that these interventions work with children aged two to five, uh, and we need to lower get the wait lists under control. Um, so there there are ha there are things happening at the level of the federal. Um, you know, Medicare is something that's seen in, in, as a federal sort of uh, as federal action, but at, at the level of, uh, of our, our provinces, there are more important things happening that, ha that affect people in the day to day. Um, so the challenges are kind of again expanding consumption of Medicare and accommodating neurodiversity. Uh, in the two more slides, I think. Yeah. So an organization in Canada called Medicare for Autism Now uh, has been uh, really focusing its attention on uh, making ABA seen as uh, medical, medically necessary and as part of what we owe autistic Canadians, autistic citizens. Um, they've, been, um, they, they've been challenged by several people, including Michelle Dawson, a very prominent uh, Canadian uh, blogger, autistic woman who has been very vocal uh, against uh, ABA. Um, so that, and so they're, but they're still talking about a ABA applied behavioral sorry applied behavioral analysis um, and um, as a form of intensive behavioral intervention and what uh, what has been controversial for many people is the idea that uh, this is a way of punishing people and trying to get them to limit behaviors that they see as not being uh, uh, normal. Um, so one thing when I went to an autism conference that was very clear from the beginning of the conference was everyone was told they could engage in whatever repetitive stimulating behavior they wanted to. So as a non-autistic person, I have never experienced this where you're in a room with people doing all kinds of things to get become acclimatized to the environment so somebody had yarn and they were playing with it. Uh, but that was a specifically political act to say, do whatever the hell you want while you're here because we understand that this behavior helps you to to adjust to this environment. Um, so, yeah. So ABA is controversial uh, for some because it's seen as a punishment, as a punitive measure. Uh, and then the one that, that I think we're still having difficulty with in Canada and in other places as well is what does it mean to support? Um, yeah. Um, what does it mean to support people with uh, different forms of neurological diversity? And I, ha I hasten to say, we talk about neurodiversity, we always say autism, but it's not just autism, right? So uh, what does it mean to think about people who, uh, you know, in Canada, we, people talk about mad pride, people, former psychiatric survivors. That fits under neurodiversity. We don't talk about it very much. And, and then the old debates about high versus low functioning, uh, functioning aut autism. And I think there's one more slide. Yeah. So uh, in terms of how we reconcile some of these challenges, um, an ethic of care is sort of one way forward, I think, in talking about how uh, and it, ha it, it fits into a, a, an approach that recognizes diversity in a more, in a more expansive way. Uh, but the idea that care work has to be valorized uh, and that uh, when we take back the welfare state, when we, when we um, retreat the welfare state uh, and remove certain elements from the you know, responsibilities of the welfare state, we inevitably push that work onto someone else, and normally that work is performed by women, normally that work is not compensated. Um, so we can engage a kind of more neoliberal perspective on thinking about how um, uh, care for autism has been, you know, Kristen Buehmiller has done very good work in the U.S. on this. Care for autism um, is, uh, has been sort of privatized in many respects, uh, and we accept it in some respects because parents are at the center of that, and we, we think that that is a, a good place to be, uh, but it's challenging uh, in terms of what 
<coughs> what we give up in terms of collective responsibility. And lastly, I like this notion of interdependence, which just kind of, just kind of pushes us away from uh, thinking about autonomy or ch challenging what we understand as autonomy. Uh, and it also helps to go beyond we love children and we don't care about adults, which seems to be very common in autism policy that we have to help the children and then when they become adults we say, well, you know, good luck. Uh, and so if you think of interdependence, then you would say that there are different ways in which we can attack, we can support people across the, I hate the term life course, but the, across the life course uh, and not think about people as less than or, or outside the sort of what is considered more normal human uh, experience. And I will say, thank you.